On the seventh day of October, Halloween gave to me seven Jodies oinking, six body swapping, five reeds a wolfing, four drunken uncles, three werewolf colonies, two spooky sisters, and a psycho who killed Janet Lee. Hey everyone, welcome to uh, the 7th of October, and thus the 7th film we're covering on the 31 Days of Halloween here on Legion Podcast, uh, or my part of it at least. There is plenty going on around Legion Podcast, uh, mind, mind all the streamers and the fake cobwebs and whatnot. Um, it is the best time of year for us. Uh, I can't tell you how much uh, fun I'm having doing these uh, conversations one-sided though they may be uh, with you the listeners as uh, we we get fired up for this season and look I'm not gonna lie to you uh, we're talking about a movie that is kind of important to me today and that's of course the Amityville Horror the OG Amityville Horror not this uh, Ryan Reynolds mess not that kind of thing no this is uh, this is the real stuff the the uncut pure stuff uh, the kind of stuff that'll get you put away for years So this came out in 1979, and I must have seen this not long after it came out, uh, because I'm an old man. Um, I I was, uh, you know, I was still a kid, don't get me wrong, I was young, but I still saw it, uh, and I think it was one of those things that made its way to HBO, and if you're born after, I don't know, the year 1990, this is all gonna sound kinda crazy, but this is all the God's honest truth. So, before there were VHS uh, players and DVD players and streaming services and that kind of thing, the only way you could ever watch anything repeatedly was either you went to the movies a bunch or HBO, which was still new. Uh, It was a nascent thing. And uh, they would get a handful of movies uh, that they would buy the rights to and they would play the hell out of those movies. Like... HBO now is more of a streaming service. I presume that's the way I uh, consume it at this point. Uh, I don't have cable. I haven't had cable in a long time. Most of the people I know don't have cable. They just subscribe to the the streaming stuff. So, and even still, I think if you uh, had cable, I think HBO just has such a big catalog at this point that they play all kinds of shit all, all the time. But back in the old days when we were using covered wagons to get to the stores, HBO had like eight movies and they would play all eight of those movies all the time. And Amityville Horror was one of those movies. And so I saw it a bunch. Uh, It's a movie that was kind of burned into my brain for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, Not the least of which is just that I saw it a bunch. Um, You know, and that's one of those, like, there's an old saying that familiarity breeds contempt. And I don't know that that's true in the case of movies, especially at a formative age, you know, when your brain's still mushy and, and you're forming uh, the, the things that you like and, and the things that you don't like. And Amityville Horror was one of those things I saw enough times that even if the movie is total garbage, I will never be able to cop to that because it's like I can almost recite it verbatim. It, it, it's a movie I saw all the time and... Uh, so I hadn't watched it in a long time is the point watched it a bunch as a kid it was a really formative kind of horror film for me Uh, for a long time it was my standard for haunted house movies Uh, although that has certainly changed uh, when I went back and watched it again recently Um, had a great experience with it though because it was like me and the lady curling up on the couch and uh, having a, a hot bowl of beans like you do, and watching uh, the Amityville Horror, um, it, just at me uh, at Legion Podcast on Twitter for more about the hot bowl of beans, um, or, or you can find me on on Facebook, um, and we'll we'll discuss uh, how all of that shook out. Anyway, beans aside, ladies and gentlemen, the important thing <laughs> is that I hadn't seen the movie in a long time, and I was really excited. Uh, to do so. Uh, I'd probably seen the remake not too terribly long ago. Well, within the past couple of years, anyway. 
and which I think is fine. I know that movie gets kind of a bad rap. I don't think it's great, but I think it's kind of fine as these remakes go. Certainly better uh, than that terrible Elm Street remake and and that Texas Chainsaw remake and uh, the Friday the Thirteenth remake. Uh, yeah, like it, it's head and shoulders above that kind of stuff uh, in my mind, at least. And so, uh, watching it again with with that in mind of like you know I don't mind the remake so much. I still prefer the '79. Uh, version and I think that all comes down to the cast um, uh, but let's do a couple of bona fides on the movie before we get into that uh, directed by a gentleman named Stuart Rosenberg who directed such movies as Cool Hand Luke you know that movie um, <laughs> Voyage of the Damned uh, which is a, a pretty good movie um, you know, like knows his way around a camera, did some good stuff, directed a bunch of TV back in the day as well. Um, a couple of Twilight Zone episodes under his belt as well. Uh, directed the Pope of Greenwich Village, which is, uh, is pretty good. And he even has an Alan Smithy under his belt for a movie called Let's Get Harry. Uh, and I always love a director that's just like, you know what? Take my name off this piece of shit. You can Alan Smithy this. And if you don't know the story, by the way, if I, uh, for those of you who do, bear with me for 15 seconds. So, Alan Smithy, for years and years, I don't know if it's used anymore, it was a name that directors used when either the edit got taken out of their hands or something happened in the production of the film that they did not want their name attached to the resulting product. And so they would opt with an Alan Smithy film. And I think there's a documentary somewhere out there about uh, the use of Alan Smithy as a name. Anyway, really interesting little tidbit of Hollywood trivia for you. And uh, it, this was written by a guy named Sandor Stern, is the the screenwriter uh, on the Amityville Horror, who had mostly done uh, television as well. And, and some TV movies and so forth. This was all based on the novel by a guy named Jay Anson. And as the story goes, that Jay Anson and the Lutzes, the uh, characters and people in the film, that they had sat down at a kitchen table over a bottle of wine and concocted this story of the haunting uh, partly because the Lutzes were in a little bit of financial trouble and, and Jay Anson wanted to make a little money himself. And so there, the, the Amityville Horror was born more uh, Merlot than Gates of Hell. <laughs> you know, the Red Room was Cabernet. <laughs> but uh, regardless of how you feel about the veracity of the story of the Amityville Horror, and I know some people will go to their graves thinking that all, all of the story that Jay Anson laid down in that book is true. I'm not one of those people, but it doesn't mean I can't enjoy it. Uh, for one thing, there, there's not a uh, hiding hair of any of the Warrens in this movie uh, who got all up in the Amityville horror once the book came out uh, because they, they never met a buck that they, uh, they didn't like. So <laughs> anyway, uh, the movie is the story of uh, the Lutz family, George and Kathy, who um, have some kids. They, they're newlyweds, uh, but they're not quite middle-aged. I would say mid-30s, something like that. I don't know that that's necessarily middle-aged. I, I kind of look at 45-ish or so to be true middle-aged, but maybe that's just because uh, I'm older and would like to believe that's true. But <laughs> they... Uh, Kathy's got three kids of her own. George is kind of marrying into this situation. They buy this house um, in Amityville. And the reason they get the house is that it's an incredible deal because a series of horrible murders. Uh, in the, the DeFeos are the, the family that owned the house before. And Ronnie DeFeo, the kid, uh, kills one of the kids in the house. Uh, kills his parents and his siblings all in a night. And they don't really go into this too much in the movie. But according to the book, 
Um, one of the curious things about this murder is that even as he was going room to room and shooting um, his siblings and parents, they never moved. They were all found laying on their stomach as if um, they slept through it all. And he said, hey, the devil made me do it. And regardless of, of what happened with Ronnie DeFeo, the Lutzes are like, hey, a deal's a deal. We don't have a lot of money. Um, we can swing this house. It's a little bit bigger and, and just a hair out of our price range. But we can swing it because I can move my office, uh, my surveying business uh, into you know this guest house. And uh, the boat that I own can go in the boat dock. And that's going to save us some money on, on the uh, harbor fees and so forth. And so they buy this house and right away weird shit starts to happen. Um, one of the, you know, big moments at the beginning of the film is that Rod Steiger, who plays uh, a priest in, in the movie, the family priest, he comes over to bless the house, goes into one of the upstairs room, like the sewing room, I think is, is what it is in the book. Um, I don't know that they put a name to it here, but at any rate, uh, flies up here on the window and on his flesh and, um, this is where you get the, the famous, as he's trying to bless the house, he, he ends up feeling terrible and getting very ill and the door opens behind him and a voice says, get out, get out. And so he does, he gets the fuck out of there. He gets out of Dodge and, uh, you know, Kathy's got an aunt who is a nun and she can't stay in the house. Uh, George's business partner uh, has a girlfriend who's kind of a medium and she can't even get close to the house because of all the bad vibes coming off of it. And um, yeah, there's a, there like uh, the, the daughter who I keep wanting to call Carol Ann, even though that is definitely not her name, um, has a playmate named Jody that uh, in the book especially, there are like child's drawings of what Jody looks like, and it's kind of this pig-like creature. And we get a glimpse at one point of this, you know, creature with red eyes outside of the, the bedroom window of the daughter. Uh, one of the kids uh, gets his hand uh, smashed by a window pane, and nobody can get the window up even though it's not latched. And, um, you know, ghost stuff. Uh, devil devil stuff happening in the house and uh, you know uh, straight up Satan is what's going on here and one thing leads to another uh, they find in the basement of this place uh, what is called the red room that contains a portal directly to hell which in my mind is the moment where the the story kind of oversteps a little bit it's like just be a spooky house don't be a gateway to hell. But, you know, you're, we're trying to move some books here, people. So, gateway to hell it is. Um, the stuff that I find most effective about the movie, though, is how it handles and depicts the sort of deteriorating relationship between George and Kathy, who at the very beginning are very much in love. And there, there's a line that he has that I think is really nice where... Um, He's looking at Kathy, played by Margot Kidder, who's really, really good in the movie. And he says, I just can't get used to you. And I really like that. I like that idea quite a bit. I think it's romantic, this notion of uh, no matter how many times I look at you, I'm still I'm still a little, you know, my socks are blown off when I look at you. And, uh, you know, it's it's nice being in love, right? And, and I think the movie... Uh, does a nice job of portraying that, that these are two people who are not, you know, new in box. They are not mint condition people. They both got a little life under their belts, but are in love with one another. And even at, when things start to go bad, uh, after George uh, starts chopping wood all the time and can't get warm and starts to be all sweaty all the time and just look generally gross, um, that even when... Kathy is worried that he's going crazy. Uh, she like she begs him, like, don't hurt my babies. 
And he's like, I'm not going to hurt any. I'm not going to hurt you. I love you. I would never do that. And it kind of snaps him out of it, which I, I again is a moment I really like. I think that that's well done. Uh, I also like when he's kind of taking his turn into being the asshole George of the movie. I really love the fact that he just can't stand these kids at all. Just has no time for their bullshit. And I, I find that very funny. Um, probably the most effective like scare scene of the movie for me is the uh, there, there's a scene where Kathy and George are going to go out for the night and they've left uh, the kids with a babysitter who, when she's in the daughter's room, ends up walking into the closet and the door closes and she can't get out. And she starts banging on the door and telling this little girl to let her out. Uh, the little girl doesn't. Later, she says it's because Jody wouldn't let her. Uh, this evil pig monster um, slash demon. But the thing that I, I love about it is that as this babysitter is banging on the door, you start to see blood appear on the door that she's just absolutely chewed up her hands trying to get out. And then the light goes out. And then when George and Kathy come home and they hear her screaming and crying, uh, they open the door and this babysitter just lets this little girl have it. Like, you know, uh, in, in a way that uh, I appreciate and I think I would do the same. Although I, I'd like to believe that I wouldn't freak out quite as much just because I was locked in a closet. But, hey, you know, to each their own, especially, uh, you know, a young teenage girl being trapped in a closet with the lights out. That, that seems pretty scary. So, but I think that scene really works. I think it's a great scene. Um, and it has a, a sense of escalation to it for sure. There's a lot of little touches I like. There's a great scene where George and his business partner go to a bar after he started shirking some responsibility and being sick and gross all the time. And the bartender drops a beer and is like, holy shit, you look just like that DeFeo guy that killed all those people in that house. And I, I, that's another little, it, it's a, uh, a brush stroke that doesn't really matter in the movie, but all of that stuff adds up. And I think that's maybe what Amityville Horror gets right, uh, that a lot of other Haunted House movies don't necessarily uh, get a handle on, is the, the idea that a lot of these things don't add up to make sense necessarily. Like, there's no reason that George would look like Ronnie DeFeo. But that adds a little bit of, of creep factor. And, and that's what a lot of these touches are. The thing with the babysitter doesn't really matter, but it's creepy. Uh, there's a moment where George may have been bitten by a statue of a lion. Doesn't add up to much, but it's creepy. And it's all these little brushstrokes that add to uh, the larger work of art that is the Amityville Horror. Um, like I said, I think Margot Kidder is just absolutely fantastic in it. She's very real. Um, I, she grounds the movie. Like she is always the, the person in the film that is just trying to keep her family together. Uh, even as George becomes more distant and potentially violent. Um, and, and in fact, smacks her at one point and, her kids are, are starting to freak out a little bit and start to feel like there was something really wrong with everything going on. Um, it's just a great film uh, and and a, a great scary movie. You know, it is definitely of its time. It is uh, a movie that is over 40 years old at this point. But I, it still works for me more so than the, the remake does. Not that the remake, the remake is just very directed. Like the, the remake is a film made in the two thousands where y you had a plot and the, you know, like the character, uh, who is it? Melissa George is in that as well. And you know, it's good actors. Uh, I think Ryan Reynolds is good in it. I, I think he does a good job of, uh, portraying the kind of creeping insanity of George Lutz in that film, but it's just way, way more of a straight line. Whereas this film, uh, the the original '79 Amityville Horror, is a little more rambling, a little more sprawling, and as a result of that, it feels more authentic. It doesn't feel like 
a Hollywood movie, it feels more like, oh, this is, can you believe this crazy shit that happened to this family? And by the way, they got the fuck out of there and left all their furniture behind and never went back to this house. And again, this was at the height of the book had come out. People believed it and thought that, the you know, on the heels of something like The Exorcist, which had only been a few years before. And people believed that too. So there was a, a credulity that was happening in the 70s in regard to some of these horror movies, which in fairness, not so much The Exorcist, but the Amityville Horror was telling you right off the bat, this happened. And, and the book in particular was, was presented as gospel. Like, you know, we have changed the names to protect the innocent, but all of this should happen. And, uh, it also works uh, on the level of, uh, you know, there is a, a definite timeline for this movie where it's like, Hey, after 19 days or 20 days or however many days it is, they stayed that they were out. And if you had read the book, which if you were alive in the late seventies, you probably had read the Amityville or it was like uh, the summer reading book, kind of like Jaws was when that movie came out or even before, I think Jaws was, was pretty popular before the, the film, but the film made it infinitely more so, but the Amityville horror was the book itself was a bestseller. Like people read the shit out of, I had a paperback copy of the Amityville horror. And I don't even know how I got it. I think they just handed it to you on the street, like the, the Hare Krishnas. Uh, but you had it. And so when you saw the movie, you were like, oh yeah, this really happened, everybody. Um, maybe they're not getting all the details with the book, right? But we all know that this happened. And yeah, it's uh, it, it, it it's amazing to think. I was going to say, it's amazing to think that we were that gullible as a society, but then you look at the world around us now and uh, how people just can't wrap their heads around the idea of getting a vaccine to save their lives and the lives of loved ones and I guess we're no smarter than we were 50 years ago or a hundred years ago. Um, you know, you hope that, that the human race is going to evolve and it just don't. Uh, but that is not the conversation we're having now. This is about the Amityville horror and, uh, and how much I love it. And I do, I do. It's a flawed movie for sure. Uh, you know, the thing with the priest ought to matter a little bit more, but that ends up going really nowhere other than he goes blind and that's kind of it. Um, you know, if, if this were a real movie and not just, uh, the, you know, the events based on the book, then it would have a more satisfying conclusion other than, well, they left, everybody (laughs) grabbed what they could hold and got the hell out of there with their dog, uh, Harry, which is a great name for a dog. Um, but, but, you know, it's a minor complaint for me. I still enjoy it. When I watch it now, I can definitely see uh, the seams of, of this movie a little more. But it means something to me. You know, this is one of those movies that's more of a comfort food. Uh, and it's something that I, I've, I've probably said already this season on the 31 Days of Hall- Halloween. And I'm almost certain to say it uh, as we move further into the 31 Days is that a lot of these movies are are just a nice warm blanket for me. And even though this is a movie in which children are put in danger and priests have to flee a house because of Satan, um, I find it weirdly soothing. And uh, it's a movie I can kind of throw on in the background this time of year and, you know, do some other stuff, clean the house or work on some Halloween decorations, Uh, which, guys, I got to tell you, I'm very very excited to show off some Halloween costumes this year. So anyway, um, but you can kind of do that stuff with a uh, Amityville horror on in the background. And I know it so well, I can just kind of drop into any of the scenes I really like, like the scene where George just goes fucking nuts in the living room for no good reason, starts freaking out in a chair, uh, or when the brother loses his money, uh, on the way, uh, to the wedding and he can't pay the caterer and all that stuff. Like, that is just stuff I kind of love about this movie because I'm so familiar with it. It feels like uh, rereading a good book. And uh, now that I say that, I feel like I should go back and reread the Amityville horror of the book uh, just just to do it, just to refresh myself. Because I remember uh, thinking how scary the book was, uh, especially compared to the movie. The movie is, is creepy, but the book was genuinely much more frightening because... 
of, you know, theater of the mind shit, right? Like, uh, you can say, hey, this babysitter got trapped in uh, a closet and you're never going to believe what she saw. And your mind uh, fills in those blanks. Whereas in the movie, it's just like, oh, she was trapped in the dark and her fingers were bloody. Uh, her knuckles were bloody from pounding on the door. And that's creepy and effective, but it's nowhere near as creepy as an, a, and effective as letting you know your own imagination fill in those blanks. Um, but nonetheless, I love the Amityville Horror. Your mileage may vary. This is one of those movies where I can't really be very objective about it. I don't know if you as a listener would enjoy it as much as I enjoy it uh, because it is such a, a nostalgic film for me. And I don't like, that's the thing. I don't like movies that try to make me feel nostalgic or shows that make me feel nostalgic. Like uh, uh, your stranger things, which is my usual punching bag for talking about nostalgia pieces. I like the movies that I saw when I was a kid. That's what makes me feel nostalgic. Not a movie or a show that reminds me of the thing that I liked. Let me just watch the thing that I liked. You know, let me let me watch uh, a, a, an Amityville horror. Let me watch a The Howling. And that's the thing that's going to make me, you know, feel a glimmer of that thing I felt when I was a kid and saw it for the first time. Um, so, yeah. That is uh, tonight's essay about nostalgia and so forth. Uh, but uh, at any rate, I hope that you enjoyed hearing me uh, lovingly discuss the Amityville Horror and all its flaws and all its strengths. Um, I'm very curious, as always, what you make of the Amityville Horror from 1979 and all of these movies. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at Legion Podcasts. Uh, you can go to Facebook and uh, there's the Facebook group and or page for Legion Podcasts and you can tag me there. Uh, or you can drop me a line at Bo, B-O, at LegionPodcasts.com if you have some thoughts uh, about these movies or suggestions for movies. Or you just want to say, hey, I heard the thing you said about the howling and I agree. I, I like that too. So it uh, means the world. It really does it means the world when when people reach out and uh, and and talk about how um, y you find these movies because uh, I think at the end of the day we're all looking uh, for a, a little bit of a home in in so many ways and that is one of the things I've always sh uh, strived to do with Legion Podcast is to make this as welcoming a place for horror fans as possible. Uh, so long as you're not an asshole. And uh, the people that I interact with who are listeners and fans and hosts of Legion Podcasts, uh, none of them are assholes, and I appreciate that a lot. Uh, so, thanks for not being an asshole. I hope you don't think I'm one. <laughs> and uh, come back tomorrow. We're going to do a whole other movie. The first week is in the books now. Uh, time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. But it's slipping all the way to Halloween. And between now and then, we are going to have 20 plus more movies uh, to discuss before we land on our final film. As always, I'm not going to tell you what we're talking about tomorrow. you got to come back and, uh, and find out for yourself what movie it is we're going to be discussing. Uh, to, hey, and let me just end by saying, hey, the Amityville Horde, you can do a whole lot worse on a chilly fall evening as Halloween approaches than to throw on the Amityville horror, pop some popcorn, curl up with uh, the person you love and, uh, and, and let a house shout at you for a little bit. So uh, thanks for listening and we'll see you again tomorrow. Tomorrow.